We meet in the name of Jesus Christ, who died and was raised to the glory of God the Father. Grace and mercy be with you all. We've come here today to remember before God our sister Janet Susan Kim, to give thanks for her life, to commend her to God our merciful Redeemer and Judge, to commit her body to be cremated, and to comfort one another in our grief. Let us pray. God of all consolation, your son Jesus Christ was moved to tears at the grave of Lazarus, his friend. Look with compassion on your children and their loss. Give to troubled hearts the light of hope and strengthen in us the gift of faith. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A very warm welcome to you all, whether you're here in church with us or whether you're joining us somewhere online, including um, the family in Australia. I hope that you can all see and hear me okay um, in Australia at the moment. Um, we have four or five different um, signals connected to the broadband in this building at the moment. So my fingers and my toes are crossed that the connection will remain stable um, for the time that we are here. Just those of us in charge, a quick reminder, we are not permitted at the moment to sing hymns I'm afraid so any of the hymns will remain unsung uh, and please um, can you make sure that you remain um, within your household or your bubble or socially distanced of two meters unmasked or one meter masked at all times as well please sit as we here played the the great um, 23rd psalm tune criminal the lord my shepherd and any words you need are printed on the orders of service if you want to follow along. <laughs>
prepared by various members of the family and friends and hopefully they should all appear on the screens around the building and um, be heard through the speakers as well. As much as we wish we could all be face to face today, Mum was good with modern technology and I think would be quietly chuffed that her funeral has been live streamed around the world. I feel very privileged to have had an amazing woman as my mother and it is my honour to be able to remember her with you today. Janet Susan Grosser was born on the 7th of May 1942. It was wartime. Her father Charlie was serving overseas and the hometown of Hull was a bombing target. So her mother Doris moved to her sister's house in Leeds to have the baby. Janet was the eldest of three children. Sadly, her sister Molly passed away in 2018. Their younger brother Duncan will also pay tribute to Janet today. Mother had many stories of growing up in Hull. She would tell us how her family sheltered under the stairs during bomb raids and how she played with her siblings on blocks of land where houses once stood, but only rubble remained. One story Grandma Janet has told my children many times is how the three siblings played families together. Janet and Molly, role-playing as mummies, did everything and anything together. And when little Duncan asked to join in, he'd be reminded to do what daddies do. So Duncan was told to get on his bike and go to work and not to come back for a few hours. None of them had any comprehension what daddy still did all day. Growing up during wartime shaped the way Janet and her siblings lived post-war. The Grosses each displayed a lot of grit and determination, were never shy of hard work and followed their passions. Janet was very accomplished for a woman of her era. She excelled at school, which qualified her to study German and Swedish at Hull University. She was the first member of the Grosser family to attend university. Mother was allocated a rare placement to study for a semester in Tübingen, Germany, and spent a vacation working in Gothenburg in Sweden. After graduating from Hull University at the age of 21, Janet went off to Germany again for a year. My father, John, will share more about this wonderful period when they met, married, and commenced their family with the birth of my older sister, Deborah. Deborah and I were blessed to have a mother who provided a steady living home. After pausing her career to have children, Janet returned to teaching part-time when I started school in 1977. She was a very flexible and capable languages teacher and was always in demand. Juggling part-time work and bringing up the family was Janet's life for many years and she did that selflessly. Deborah reminded me that even when returning home after working a day in school, Mum was always cheerful and looked especially smart. She cooked from scratch for the family every evening and looked after us all. She was a good role model. Mother always said she had a fortunate life with John. During their 55 years of marriage together, they created the family home, shared a love of community and were challenging intellectual partners for each other. They were true soulmates. Janet had creative talent. She enjoyed attending classes in pottery and painting. Dressmaking, <laughs> and crochet were all self-taught or learned from her mother. 
she could turn her hand to most things around the home, including wallpapering and painting. Her attention to detail and the perfectionism that went into each project was unsurpassed. We all played music at home. As adults, both parents took on piano lessons for themselves to ensure they could give us the support we needed. Janet and John sang in various choirs. Janet enjoyed her garden. She proudly grew many fruits and vegetables that she would turn into delicious meals. I remember apple pies, green tomato chutney, elderflower champagne, and there were always, always homemade strawberry jam. It seemed she could make something out of anything and nothing went to waste. She planted a tree for each of our children so they would flower in England when the children in Australia had their birthdays. Janet was very pleased when she managed to bring a frangipani cutting from our garden in Sydney and nurture it to grow and flower in England. It was another project that she was determined to master and of course she did. Family and travel were important to Janet too. For many years, my mother enjoyed hosting family Christmas at our house. My grandparents would come and stay for a week and one would tirelessly cater for everyone's favorites. Everything was prepared lovingly from scratch, of course. Many childhood holidays were spent with our cousins, Simon and Peter, whilst mum and her sister, Molly, also enjoyed spending time together. We explored the Yorkshire, Yorkshire Dales or the Lake District and shared times staying at each other's houses. Each year without fail, we had a family summer holiday for a week. We covered the coasts of Wales or the South West. The catered aspect of the holiday was what mother most enjoyed, to not have to shop, cook or clean for just one week a year. When Deborah and I were teenagers, our parents took us on European holidays, sharing their passion for travel, history, culture and language. We visited France and more regularly Germany. Both Janet and John learned Italian as adults and broadened their travel horizons to Italy. They've also been to the United States. More recently they enjoyed guided tours and river cruises, including one cruise from Moscow to St Petersburg. When I moved to Australia in 2003, they embraced the opportunity for another travel destination. They have since visited Australia 16 times and I've taken in several other countries on the way. Janet and John have been quite involved with our lives in Australia, having visited for our wedding, Christmas, birthdays, joined our family holidays, and enjoyed spending time with Lynn's extended family. But most of the time, just loved to be included in our normal family life in our household. A generation on, many things are different, but the values are the same. Our three children, Hugo, Eliza and Miranda, each have very special relationships with Grandma Janet and have memories which they will treasure. Janet taught our girls needlecraft and has spent many hours reading, baking and playing board games, as well as encouraging both Eliza and Miranda with their music. Janet liked to draw animals with Hugo when he was very young and she was always happy to help with school homework. Now a little older, Hugo has enjoyed many topical discussions with Grandma Janet. Janet was dedicated to helping other people. Together with my father, Janet applied her practical skills to assist Deborah and myself with multiple house moves. Tirelessly decorating, gardening, bringing furniture, and sometimes staying in less than comfortable circumstances in order to be there when needed. Their practical help and advice on how to run a home has been invaluable to Deborah and myself. Janet volunteered at Catherine House Hospice for 20 years and worked on the church magazine for more than 10 years. She was a great neighbour and friend, helping wherever she could. My mother Janet was very determined. Living by her values, she became a lifelong learner and teacher. Whether she was preparing lessons, mastering a new language, planting the garden, helping children or grandchildren with homework or music, working at Catherine House Hospice or on the church magazine, or just playing with the grandchildren. She showed an attention to detail, a love of challenges, and a desire for mastery. She accomplished a lot professionally and in volunteering capacities. She was a wonderful wife to John during 55 years of marriage, a caring sister, aunt, and grandmother. She was the best mum in the world. With so many wonderful memories to cherish, Janet will remain in our hearts forever. So what can I tell you about my sister? 
Well, I'm starting my few words here, going back as far as I can recall. And as Ed has already mentioned in his lovely tribute, Janet was the oldest of us three siblings, Sister Molly in the middle and then myself. And being the oldest, Janet was usually the quiet, sensitive one, usually. And having been born during the war and growing up in the 40s and 50s, she would have been very much aware, I think, of the demands that were placed on her parents, running a house with three young children, dealing with the problems of increasing frailty in our grandparents. In fact, our maternal grandmother lived with us for the last few years of her life. That would be quite a workload, I think, for our mother. So Janet's early years would have been very much informed by the difficulties of family life in these post-war years. She attended Brickland Avenue Infants and Junior Schools, as did the three of us, in fact, before going on to Newland High School for Girls, followed by Molly just a few years later. Also for a time, she was a member of the Girl Guides, which I remember she really enjoyed. In fact, the family went to see her at Guides Camp one time, when they all slept in these huge great bell tents. Maybe that's where she took a dislike to tents. She was never terribly keen on the idea of camping in later life. Music was always there in our family, and Janet had her first piano lessons at home with Miss Harrison, as did Molly. And I remember this lady coming to our house, and I also remember watching these lessons with great interest, but of course I was considered way too young. But in 1951, when Janet was about nine years old, she and I were both taken to see a Miss Farbstein, Rose Farbstein, who was a highly regarded piano teacher in Hull at that time. I know it was around 1951 because I was just four years of age. But regardless of age, Rose Farbstein also agreed to teach me. So we would go there with mother after Janet finished school and have our lessons back to back. So Janet had a good musical grounding, returning to music later with her young family and more recently, of course, with the choir. But back then, school studies were her main thing. She was always so diligent. And as Ed mentioned, she was a brilliant linguist. I always envied her in that respect. And then after Newland High School, it was on to Hull University. Now, one lasting memory from me from that period was a friend of Janet's whose name escapes me actually, but she would come to our house armed with what we then referred to as modern jazz records, very bohemian. I would have been about 13 at the time. And I remember one particular, Miles Davis LP, which had this dark, moody sleeve. I loved it. So that was Janet's beatnik period, I suppose, and I'll bet you didn't know about that. I think Ed's eulogy has covered the next period in some detail, so I'm going to skip forward now a few years to around 1970, going into 71, when John and Janet were living in Worcester Park, Surrey, together with this little person in a pram by the name of Deborah, soon followed, of course, by another little person in another pram by the name of Edwin. This was around the time when I had recently arrived in London, pursuing the musical dream. And so each weekend, this long-haired, bearded character in an Afghan coat and white boots would hop onto the train out of Waterloo Station and arrive at their door looking for Sunday lunch. And of course, I was always made welcome. It really felt like home from home. So, by way of a contribution to the proceedings, I might try to help with the lunch, maybe with the dishes or putting away the cutlery. But it was only many years later that John happened to mention that in fact I'd been putting the cutlery away in all the wrong places and it would take them all week to put things back where they should be. And then of course I'd arrive again the following week and we'd do it all over again. So I think for almost all of my first year in London, Worcester Park was my home from home. And this illustrates so well, I think, the close family ties which we've always guarded, all of us. And of course, we continue to do so. So all the way through from childhood, all the way through our lives, in fact, Janet was there, just being Janet. And for that, I'm so very grateful. I know I'm following some very sincere words this afternoon. And these are, of course, sincere as well. You know, sometimes in a couple, you've got a tidy spouse and an untidy one. And uh, guess which one I was? 
Well, Jana used to catch me hoarding stuff, and I used to get, you can, can you not move that from the shelf? It's been there too long. Can you not, uh, why did you put that in the corner of the lounge? Things like that. Just occasionally, the artifacts or things that I hold, hold some interest. Here we have a reference to, it is the program of, the course for British assistance in German-speaking countries in Germany and the Rhineland, starting on the 26th of August in 1963. Now, I met Janet there, and our friendship and more came from uh, meeting her there. A group of about 30 people, in which the British Council um, gave us a lot of hints as to how to model our teaching. They also told us about how German was actually, sorry, English was actually being taught in German schools. And um, also there were interesting things like um, uh, there, there, there were singing evenings both uh, there and down at the pubs in, in, in the town, but not only that, there were, um, we were, it was pointed out to us that it was 400 years of Shakespeare, for example, and there was social change in Britain. And this was the period of uh, Kennedy was assassinated, he'd just been a heroic visitor to Germany at that time. Um, there was um, ready for an election the following year. Douglas Home didn't uh, um, rule for too long as Premier, but Wilson was on the wing when he was willing to take over. And um, the Beatles, oh yes, they were holding hands in German by then. Their uh, translations were flowing. So here was the week then, where there was quite a lot of free time, and Janet and I seemed to associate an awful lot during that time, sitting next to each other in lectures and... and um, oh, one evening we didn't get in, I have to say, the place was locked and balmy evening. Spent till the early morning on the park benches on the banks of the Rhine. This was just near Bonn, the capital of the city. The um, thing was that Janet had um, asked to be in North Germany and her school was in an industrial belt in Bochum. I had asked to be in South Germany, close to German friends, just as that was Janet's reason in the north as well. And uh, we were about 10 hours apart on trains, and it was plural trains. It was sort of in my rather isolated small town area, which was on the river Danube, the upper Danube, Siegmagingen. Uh, there was, oh, sort of rail bus and then steam trains still on. And when you got to Stuttgart, you were on the main intercity line and could speed up to Bochum and just a tram next, and then you, then you met Janet. It's about 10 hours. We met up a number of times during the year, and clearly our relationship was becoming serious. And we enjoyed trips, of course, across the border to Vienna and Salzburg as well. And we were in the Black Forest and the um, Heidelberg area as well. We had ourselves arranged in May to have our parents over, so we made sure our parents met the two different uh, um, groups and um, enjoyed uh, a few days together socialising and touristing uh, on the Rhine. The British Council also took us to uh, West Berlin flying in uh, with a trip across to East Berlin as well as sightseers and uh, the, the, the group were saying to me, oh you two are you still together? I don't think we used the word being an item in those days but they were certainly noticing that we were, we were very fond of each other. Well, we got engaged, we got married the following year then in 65, uh, and uh, the first few years can be uh, reckoned uh, uh, thus. We started uh, off deliberately a long way south of the north of England. Uh, we thought we'd like the fresh start with no interference, if you like, or excessive interest from our parents and family. And we were in Buckinghamshire, and we had a good fortune to get jobs in schools in adjacent towns, Marlow and High Wycombe. We were in uh, Wycombe in the first year. Um, it was rented. We, it was also rented the second year, but um, with our furniture. Third year we bought a car. Fourth year we started a mortgage, uh, which eventually we paid in the year 2000, the record shows. shows. And uh, also we had time to um, equip the kitchen better and to add some central heat into our little house, which is in the Surrey suburbs of London, before our two children came along. You've heard the story of the family, 
I've been totally blessed uh, throughout life to have been the partner of Janet. I shall miss her dearly. Cards from about 70 people confirm how friendly, helpful and what a pleasant cursed personality Janet was. I loved her to bits. I really miss you. Janet, rest in peace. Become involved. At that time, we were meeting on the first Monday of the month in the vestry at All Saints. Soon after this, I decided to host the meeting at my home in more comfortable surroundings. Janet was often early for the meeting, and we would chat and share experiences of our visits to families in Sydney, exchanging tips about best car hire. No birds was the recommended choice for that. And we also shared, exchanged places to visit as well. Janet, knowing my weakness for Tim Tams, a delicious Aussie biscuit, would always bring back a packet to share at our team meeting. In 2007, when Zena Palmer gave up the responsibility for advertising, Janet agreed to take this, this on. This is a time consuming job, which requires great attention to detail, which Janet excelled at. Janet started each year in January, ringing all 72 of our advertisers to persuade and encourage them to continue with their support of the three-decker for another year. She believed that this personal contact each year was essential before the invoices were sent out, all by post in those days, as many advertisers had no email addresses. There then followed many weeks where Janet was dealing with changes to the adverts, sending reminders for payment and recording payments as they came in. Even when the new advertising year started in April, Janet was still chasing late payers. She never gave up. During Janet's tenure, we were able to raise over £8,000 in advertising revenue each year. This not only helped pay for the publication of the magazine, but also meant that we were able to pass on a considerable amount to parish funds. Janet worked tirelessly in this role for 10 years until it became increasingly more difficult to deal with the renewals and organise visits to the family in Australia at the same time of year autumn being a good time to visit Sydney, as it was cooling down after the heat of the summer. Having relinquished the advertising role, I was enormously grateful that Janet wanted to stay on the team. She was a great asset with her organisational ability, attention to detail and her linguistic skills. Her proofreading of copy at meetings was legendary. On a personal note, I valued her judgments and her support and encouragement when difficult decisions needed to be made, particularly during the pandemic, when only a digital edition of the Decca has been possible. During this time, 
Janet's concern was for the many of our normal readership who have been unable to access the digital edition. She worried that they may well lose interest and forget about the magazine in future. We will do our best not to let this happen, Janet. We will miss you, but we give thanks to God for the time and skills you offered in support of this parish's mission and outreach work. Thank you to all of you for your words. Let us pray. Merciful Father, hear our prayers and comfort us. Renew our trust in your Son, whom you raised from the dead. Strengthen our faith that Janet and all who have died in the love of Christ will share in his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you, one God, now and forever. Amen. We've heard already, and we all know too well, the impact that music has had on Janet's, uh, Janet's life. And so, for now, we'll listen to a setting of The Lark Ascending, played by Deborah on the violin. And there'll be some images, hopefully, coming up on the screen, some pictures and photographs and memories of Janet. So please, have a look at those images, and as you watch them, reflect on Janet's life and give thanks to God for all that your memories of her.
Our scripture reading today is from Psalm 121, one of the Song of Ascents. I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Let us pray. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. That opening few lines of the 121st Psalm, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills, from where will my help come? Or in the Book of Common Prayer, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help? These are words we'll be hearing again today at the end of our service, performed by Stafford and District Choral Society in the recital of Mendelssohn's Elijah for their Millennium Concert. Although there are countless other composers who have set the psalm to music, Howells, Stanford, Dvorak, Bernstein, McKee, and countless, countless others. These are words which are prescribed by the prayer group for prayer book for use on the 27th day of each month at morning prayer. These are words which the German Lutheran Church uses in both baptism services and funeral services. And I suspect, although I haven't actually gone and checked every one, these are words which will be quite frequently written outside this very building, a building which Janet attended so faithfully on several of the monuments and the gravestones around us. But even more fitting than that, this psalm is a psalm of journeys. Indeed, many scholars suggest that the psalm was originally written as a duet, one for two voices. The first, the traveller, the second, the person staying behind. The traveller in those first couple of lines expressing concern about what is going to happen in the journey ahead and the person staying behind replying with words of assurance that God will be with them in their travels. I do hope that Janet, someone for whom travelling was such an important part of her life, whether it was those 10 hour train rides in Germany to meet up with John, whether it was the 19 odd hours of flight to get to Australia, or whatever else it was in between, would appreciate having this psalm read out at her funeral. These words describe the faithfulness of God, a God who will be there for us if we allow him. The God described in this psalm the God who will be with us even in the difficult, difficult stages of our journey, is a God whose power we can rely on, even when we are feeling at our most helpless and incapable. It's a God who will not sleep on the job, who will be there for us both day and night. A God who will watch us over the motion of our lives. A God whose protection will be all-encompassing. A God who has decided and knows that we are not throwaways, something to be discarded on the side of the road as part of your journey through life, but someone to be cherished, protected, and walked with through it all. That is the God who watched over Janet in all her journeys, in her teaching life, in her family life, 
in her travels around across the world and this country. That is the God who accompanied her on those journeys in all that she did. Whether she was on her own, whether she was with John, with the family, or with each and every one of you. And that's the God who will watch over us and accompany us now as we continue on our journey through this life. Janet, in this next stage of your journey, I do truly believe that your Lord will continue to remain your keeper, your shade, at your right hand, that he will still keep your going out and your coming in, just as he did in your earthly life. And John, Duncan, Edwin, Deborah, Hugo, Eliza, Miranda, and everyone else here or elsewhere. Be sure that he will do the same for you. He will remain your keeper, your shade at your right hand. He will keep your going out and your coming in. He will be with you in all that you do as you embark on this new stage of your journeys of life without Janet. The hope you can get from that won't, I'm afraid, take away any of the pain and the hurt that you might be feeling today. And it's important that we acknowledge the pain of our loss and sorrow. But it can give you an assurance, an assurance that you're not going to journey through all this on your own, but you'll do so together and with Jesus Christ through the good times and the hard, in all his goodness and loving mercy, until we all journey with Janet once more. As that journey continues, as it gets dark and tough, and as it gets light and joyful, know that help will come from the Lord. You don't need to walk through that on your own. Amen. We now have some poetry and music recording from the grandchildren in Australia, which again hopefully should come up on the screens shortly. A life well lived is a precious gift of hope and strength and grace from someone who has made our world a brighter, better place. It's filled with moments sweet and sad, with smiles and sometimes tears, with friendships formed and good times shared and laughter through the years. A life well lived is a legacy of joy and pride and pleasure, a living lasting memory our grateful hearts will treasure.
Let us pray. God of mercy, Lord of life, you have made us in your image to reflect your truth and light. We give you thanks for Janet, for the grace and mercy she received from you, for all that was good in her life, and for all the memories which we treasure today. You promised eternal life to those who believe. Remember for good this your servant Janet, as we also remember her. Bring all who rest in Christ into the fullness of your kingdom, where sins have been forgiven and death is no more. Your mighty power brings joy out of grief and life out of death. Look in mercy on John, Deborah, Edwin, Eliza, Miranda, Hugo, Duncan, and all other family and friends who mourn. Give them patient faith in times of darkness. Strengthen them with the knowledge of your love. God of mercy, entrusting into your hands all that you have made and rejoicing in our communion with all your faithful people, we make these our prayers through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who taught us as we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. We've heard much about life in Australia and life in Germany as well as this country today, so it seems fitting we couldn't possibly have this service without hearing a piece from Bach. And so now Roy is going to play the Adagio from Concerto No. 2 in A minor.
Please stand as we commend Janet to the loving care of God, our Maker and our Redeemer. And just a reminder for those of us in the pews, when um, it comes to us leaving, can you make sure there's a metre between you and the aisle so people can safely get past, please? Let us take Janet to our place of rest. 